I'm excited to be here with Fab Giovanetti. Um, I, we're kindred spirits because we both love to talk about marketing, about productivity, and um, Fab, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you today. Yeah, so let me kind of uh, share your, I, I like you sent me your bio and you sent me like an informal part of it, which I really enjoy. But you know, the formal part is that you're the founder of uh, Creative Impact, which is a collective of hundreds of creatives that are making impact on others and the planet. And I love that. Um, you've been, you've impacted a lot of people through your social media, your writings, your website, all of that's linked below. So folks, be sure to check out the links there. Your informal bio is that you're Italian with a British sense of humor, um, a lover of marketing on a mission to help people reclaim their time, which we're going to talk a lot about today in this interview. You're also a sloth lover, uh, lover of sloths, and you're made of 20% pizza. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love it. Um, okay, so, you know, this marketing and time is something a lot of people don't realize is actually quite related. And that's not a surprise that you kind of talk about both things. So maybe we'll start there. What, why do you think it's important to talk about reclaiming time? What does that really mean for you? That's an excellent question. Well, one of the reasons why I love to talk about reclaiming time and understanding where our time goes is because I call myself a recovering workaholic uh, because I love what I do. And I think a lot of folks watching, they might relate to that. When you love what you do, you know, don't mind doing it a bit more. You don't mind putting in the extra hours or the extra time. But I always came to realize that I would feel that that was for me to almost bank on talking about the idea of time being wealth, which in my book, Reclaim Your Time Off, I talk about actually that. If time is also a currency right now, we are almost banking it in for that day that comes where we can then take more time to do also the other things that we love. And what I challenged for years, right, even before I wrote the book, was the idea that why would we keep doing that for tomorrow, next month, in 10 years? And then what would happen is, what do you really expect is going to happen in 10 years or in five is that a little time fairy coming and be like you did you now it's time for you to chill it doesn't really happen I've been I don't know obviously how long you've been in business but I've been in business for eight years myself and the fairy never came the universe never dropped like any of those hints on me it was myself to actually come to the decision of I'm going to manage my time better and start reclaiming that space for myself now and see where my time goes. And being a marketer by trade for the past 10 years, I noticed that when running a business, um, that is really where a lot of the time can be spent because marketing is relationships and is relationship building. And we all know if we have been in love and we had partners, building relationships take time. And it takes time also when it comes to your customers and your audience. So we really need to be mindful of these things as well, I think. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And uh, as you say, the time fairy never came to say, all right, now you suddenly it's like you have to be your own time fairy, <laughs> right? Like you have to be the one. And, uh, and back to this relationship between marketing and time, uh, I have felt just like you, and I've seen this, like the more, the better you get at marketing, the irony is that the less time you're going to have because the bigger of an audience you're going to have, right? And the more clients you may have, uh, the more products you may be putting out there. But it's like, you, we all have to learn marketing to get our business on track. And then, then our time becomes increasingly more in demand. So um, this is related, of course, to boundaries. And that's something that you, you love to talk about as well. And you have a lot to say about that. So tell me about what you've noticed, maybe we'll say, well, I'll, we'll put it this way. As you have worked with lots of entrepreneurs, lots of business owners, lots of clients on helping them reclaim their time, what have you noticed is a common, I don't know, maybe to tell, like setting boundaries is not something I think we're, we, we learn growing up. I think that's something you kind of increasingly have to learn as an adult. So what have you noticed to be a common kind of pitfall for people or, or, blind spot for people in regards to that? That's an excellent question. And I think we 
want to know how to set better boundaries and i'm like that's that's excellent that that's a really good point and it's catchy don't get me wrong like that that side of things is good but the problem is a lot of the times the main problem is and the pitfall is that we don't know where we should put those boundaries so when i ask up to people okay you want to set boundaries yes because that means i have more time and i'm like excellent with whom or how on which areas of your life and people are like well, I just want to make sure that I said, you know, I know what people are wanting from me. And I'm like, okay, what expectations are you setting? Oh, yeah, you're right. Because we think, and that's the problem, let me explain a bit better, because people might be like, okay, tell me more. The problem is, we all have different expectations. I'll give you an example. Um, right before I was publishing the book, Reclaim Your Time Off, what happened was, I realized that I was falling into my own trap when a client of mine, um, they were, we were talking and she said to me, wow, you never respond to emails on a weekend. You never check your emails on a weekend. I was like, yeah, that's that's literally how I roll. That's, that's, to me, it's not natural. I literally can keep it off. And she was like, well, you know, something that I would do a lot and I really struggle with. And, you know, uh, she emailed me by mistake once in a week and I obviously responded on Monday and it was fine because there wasn't an, an expectation there. But it also made me reflect again. And I was like, wait a second. I almost forgot that actually the way that for me is normal to communicate, to interact with people is not the same for other people around me. And once we do that and we realize that maybe it's work, maybe it's personal life, maybe it's relationships, God, it can even be family for what knows. Once we understand which areas can be some of our blind spots, then we can go back and say, okay, are there any expectations set? Are there any, I'm going to use a, a strong word, rules that we set between ourselves and others? Do people know when we're available or not? And a lot of the time, once you go back to the area, I line that and then look at the expectations that you set or lack to set, then you will learn something. And it also helps you being a bit kinder with people. Again, she thought that working on weekends or responding to email on weekends is the norm. For me, it wasn't. So being able to communicate that means that she knows when I'm around and she knows when I'm not. And that can work for any client, team members, even family. If you have some time that you're really dedicated to some stuff where you don't want any distraction, don't assume that people will know just because you give them the evil eye. Actually tell them, like, I'm going to go in this room or I'm going to do this thing and for this hour, don't disturb me or please try to get the children away from me, whatever that might be. I yeah. don't know if it makes sense, but I think it's a big thing. Yeah, totally, totally. I, I, I love those examples. Um, I think, I, well, I, I tend to have a lot of um, very uh, kind and generous people in my audience and you probably do as well, people who really care. And if we are kind, generous, caring people, we tend to have a harder time with boundaries because boundaries feel like not being nice. Um, we don't wanna be seen as not nice. We, want to, we don't wanna feel like we're not, we're not good people, nice people. And so, I don't know, maybe you could tell us a bit about your perspective on this. How can, how can nice people set boundaries and still be nice people? I don't know. That's kind of a kind of a left field question, but I'm curious what your perspective is on that. It's not left field. It's, it's spot on. And actually, I'm first of all, I'm going to redirect you to another person. So my friend Chloe Brotheridge in, in the book, which is this bad guy reclaim your time off. Sorry, I'm checking it because it's one of those things. But she talks specifically about actually stress and confidence and boundaries. So again, I asked her to actually tell us a bit more about this. So I recommend to check out, she's called Chloe Brotheridge's work. She's excellent. She wrote three books herself. And her first book is The Anxiety Solution. Now, I talk about her because she talks a lot about the root of the people pleasing sort of feeling that might come across as well and that might come up. So I, I don't want to touch on that as much because it's not my area of expertise. And it goes a lot into the confidence and a lot into the mindset. However, I'm going to give you the most matter of fact answer to this, especially if you're kind, especially if you're a giving person. I'm, I'm a giver myself. You remember, you cannot give from an empty cup. So especially if you want to be helping others, if you want to be supporting others, you cannot give anything if you're nothing left in the tank. And when we remember that, we're like, oh, wait, this is what literally 
you know, the cycles of energies are. This is literally what you can even say karma is if you want to go that way. You know, you give and then you get, and then you follow in that cycle. It means that you need to look at yourself first in order to be able to look after other people. This is obviously the matter of fact element. One more thing that I also want to say is that get uncomfortable with saying no a bit more, especially when it feels that that no is the right thing right now because you're protecting energy, you don't have time. Just get comfortable because the fear of the response of other people is what prevents us from actually saying no from a healthy place. So once you say no to something that doesn't feel right or you don't have capacity for, most times people will be like, okay, fine. Can I come back to you later? Sure, great, see you later. And once you're like, okay, oh, wait a second, nobody screamed at me, nobody was angry at me. And actually getting used to see the response can teach us that at the end of the day, life is made of choices. And when we are able to you know, to be confident and firm in our response either way, people will appreciate that and accept that. So we'll say these two things from my perspective is definitely get comfortable with saying no and living in that fear that will come up at first, even before you say it. And also remember that you cannot give from an empty cap, cap, cup, not cap. Um, and when you learn how to do that, then you will see why putting yourself first can be a priority in order to give to others. Uh, beautiful. Yeah. You know, it, it's, um, it's interesting because I think a lot of givers do find joy or mm, let me, let me back up a little bit. Um, <laughs> this actually relates to creativity and like working on our business because it's usually easier to take care of someone else's needs and demands and wants than it is to, <laughs> to buckle down and you know write that blog post or sales page or send that you know kind of email to a you know potential referral source or whatever it is or that potential client it's like oh hey my family member needs me oh my client uh just emailed me or oh my friend texted me and wants to wants to talk <laughs> right and so um, we, we get, well, I'm, I'm going to be a nice person. I'm going to be, I'm a generous person. So I, they, they want to talk right now. Sure. I'm going to go and talk with them or they need help right now. Sure. Oh, Hey, I want, you know, I'm enjoying this connection. Let me just hang out a bit longer. So how do you, how, how do you deal with that in, in your life? Or maybe you have worked with people on this. It's like, it's, it's that, it's that maybe, um, some people call it resistance, right? The, the resistance of doing our work and just kind of using other people's demands as an excuse to say, well, I'm, 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 an, I'm a good person and it might even help my business. Because, right? So what, what do you think about that? Well, to be honest, when I work with people, especially from working on a one-to-one -one perspective or with our members in the collective, I always start digging a bit more in the, into the questions. Now I'm going to bring my marketing background, which is completely less field right now. Um, because it's, it's a very practical exercise that you do when it comes to discovering marketing messages, which is something you would do for any brand, right? especially for startups or kind of like more traditional companies. It's called the brand ladder method, and it bases on the way that we make decisions in life. And then literally, if you're a coach and you don't know this, um, this is also potentially some of the things that you've learned to come back from this, because it's a very simple emotional method. And it's all about asking the simple question actually george can you guess the question maybe maybe you know hmm. well uh, I mean, the, the simple question could be who, who am i <laughs> or <laughs> right well, or the best stage. what's that if that is the stage that we're at that might be a bit too much yeah <laughs> but i mean another another uh question might be um well i mean it's it's uh, we're, if we're talking about branding it's it's like how uh, what persona is impactful to the audience, something like that. But anyway, what I, I, I'd love to know what you were thinking. <laughs> yes. um, the question that you would ask for the brand laundering method, regardless of what you're trying to discover about your customers and or about yourself, and this is where I'm bringing it in, is why? Literally why? And you're okay, okay, thanks Fab, okay, cool. So let's say you're resisting to actually put, put your work in or let you're resisting to work on a sales page, that's a big one, why? because I want to help other people. Okay. But you stop and you say, okay, let's go back. But why do you want to help other people instead of working on your sales page? Because, and then that could be the second step because working on my sales page makes me feel uncomfortable. And why is that? 
So I would say go back to the why. And the first reason that you are probably focusing your attention on something else is because it's either too uncomfortable or it's bringing up something or there's something beneath that. So if you really go that deep down to that, obviously you do it also because you're a good person, but as humans, we are trying to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And you'll be like, fab, uh, sales pages are not that scary. But for a lot of people, it could be putting yourself out there or pricing yeah, yourself. I, I was going to say it is scary. <laughs> it is scary, right? Because it's like, it's the, well, we all, we all like brilliantly said, we, we, we go towards pleasure, we avoid pain, we avoid rejection, we avoid the pain that, that people didn't buy. <laughs> the pain of silence, the pain of no response. But yeah, keep going. Absolutely. And that's literally that, to be honest. It's it's that simple question of why, which the reason why again they do it when it comes to uh, marketing messaging is because when you ask people the reason for something and you ask them the simple question of why back enough, enough times, you will get to the crook of the matter. You will really be able to see that. So it's great to be wanting to be giving, but I also find that because these things, again, as you said, if you're generous and kind, it also makes you feel important. It gives you some love back and it's pleasurable. But then there are the focuses, the important things, the priorities, then there must be something there that is stopping you from following that. The last thing I'm going to say, which we talk a lot about also in the book, is that we tend to focus more when it comes to what we're doing and prioritizing on what's urgent than what's important. The problem is, there's always going to be the little things that are more urgent. I'm going to do quotation marks here. Then the most important thing you can do today, which is sending that email to follow up on a client or to ask somebody to work with you or to send a book proposal, whatever that is. So it's a similar process. Like we focus a lot on what is urgent. And sometimes we need to focus on what's important to get us closer to where we want to get, especially if you're uncomfortable because we're building that muscle, as you mentioned, rejection is a big one as well. And kind of trying to work past that is up leveling literally at its finest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of time, our time has flown, flown by really fast and I want to make sure people uh, know about the book again. So you have it right there. That's great. You want to hold it up and, and show us again, the book. Yay. Reclaim your time off. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Reclaim your time off. Okay. So, and then the other thing I want you to talk, talk about a little bit is that you have a, an accelerator program. First of all, what is an accelerator? And this one is a, is a, is a, is a concise one. It's six weeks, right? So tell us, um, yeah, tell us anything you like about, about that. Oh, thank you so much. Well, when it comes to the accelerator, what it is, is a way for us to take some of the things that I teach when it comes to creative impact and the work that I do. In this case, is accelerator is about building and validating digital products and promoting them, I should say. So we go through the different steps. So actually understanding what is that you want to do when it comes to scaling from a one to one perspective to any digital product. So think about courses, programs again but also memberships, all stuff that we have done in the past eight years. And I just give you the framework and usually that will come as a course, but with the accelerator, every single week, we're gonna check in, go through the content together, being able to review and look at what you're already thinking about or what you're creating and get the tailored feedback. It's my favorite way to work aside from one-to-one -one because it really allows me to work with more people following something that we know works and we've seen the results, but in a group environment, which I think just gets people more accountable as well. Yeah, yeah, fabulous. And um, uh, what kind of person should consider joining this accelerator program? Tell us about um, who it's for, maybe who it's not for. Any, any, any uh, ideas there? That's perfect. So when it comes to the people that is for, I would say that because of the examples that we use, I work and creative impact mainly. We work with creatives and experts that want to make a positive impact in the world just to give you the wider spectrum of the people that you find in the group usually. So the nutritionists, the coaches, uh, again, the experts, the personal trainers, you name them. There's a, a plethora of people that we have. We've got hundreds of people in the collective. Um, who is not for, I would say, is people that have any, that would be my suggestion, to be honest. People that haven't started even working with clients on a one-to-one -one basis and they've not understood exactly what their method is or what their framework is or what type of work they want to do. Uh, I would say that probably you don't want to jump on into this. First, you want to focus on really understanding what your clients want. But if you already have worked on this for a while, if you either have an idea bubbling or you already know exactly what you want to build, 
basically I can teach you all the mistakes that I made and make sure that you don't make them. Because again, the good thing about starting really early, eight years ago, is that we tried a lot of things and we really learned and put the studies in to make sure that your students, your clients will go through the best possible digital product ever. Nice, nice. Well, uh, as we can conclude this conversation, um, is there a one kind of send off encouragement or tip that you'd like to share with those who are watching? Can I use a very, very um, kind of well used quote just because I like it? It's one of my favorite ones. I think it's a good reminder if we say this to ourselves, I think every day kind of helps. Um, the usual life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. So remember, like your thoughts and, and your mind have got so much way into the way that you live your life. You can focus on the sunshine or you can focus on the fact that it's too hot. You know, just remember this, that you, wherever you put your focus on, that grows. And if you make it the positive, if you make it the abundant things, if you make it the wins, that can only be a good thing. Mm, brilliant. That's a great way for us to, to finish up. So thank you so much, Fab for the work that you do and how you do it and the community that you foster. And uh, folks, there are links below that take you to Fab social media, website, book, et cetera. So check it out. Thanks so much, Fab. Thank you so much for having me.